Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Adrian Dix. I'm BC's Minister of Health. To my right is Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer. This is our COVID-19 uh, briefing for British Columbia for uh, Thursday, November 19th, 2020. I want to say how we are honored to be on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people of the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. Tomorrow, Friday, at three, around 3 o'clock, we will provide, be providing a written briefing with uh, relevant information about COVID cases in British Columbia. On Monday, we'll be back here in Victoria in the Press Gallery Theatre uh, briefing. Uh, Dr. Henry and I will be at 3 o'clock. And with that, it's my honour to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Uh, so for today, um, I want to uh, report a total of 538 new cases of COVID-19 in British Columbia, including nine epidemiologically linked cases, bringing our total to 24,960 people in British Columbia with COVID-19. Uh, the new cases by Health Authority, 178 are in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 309 people are in the Fraser Health Region, 12 people reside in the Vancouver Island Health Region, 28 people in the Interior Health Region, and 11 people are from the Northern Health Region. We now have 6,929 active cases of COVID-19 in the province in all of our health authorities. Um, of whom 217 are in hospital, 59 of whom are in critical care or ICU. We have had sadly one additional death in the last 24 hours, bringing the number of people in British Columbia who have died from COVID-19 to 321. As always, we send our deep condolences and to, the, to the family, to the care providers of this person, uh, one of our seniors who we've lost from long-term care. We now have 9,929 people under active public health monitoring across the province and 17,207 people who have recovered from COVID-19. We have six new health care outbreaks uh, to report and no new ones that have been declared over, bringing our total to 59 active outbreaks in our health care system, 41 in long-term care or assisted living and, uh, sorry, 40 in long-term care and assisted living and 19 in acute care. We also have a, an additional outbreak in a community to report and this is at the the Floor B, BC LNG Joint Venture, a contracted site of the LNG Canada plant and project in Kitimat, where we have a number of workers at that site who have tested positive for COVID-19 and the investigation with Northern Health and the, um, and the, uh, uh, the owners and, and contractor of that facility are ongoing. So today, as is no surprise to anybody, we are in our second surge and it is proving to be a challenge. While we all hoped that we would not experience a second wave based on what has been happening around the world, around this country and around our province, we anticipated that this may occur. We knew that every pandemic that we've ever had has had more than one wave. And this has been proving to us and to people around the globe that this is a challenging virus to deal with. Despite where we may be today, I remain confident and I know we will get through this. But we need to take more action now. COVID-19 is a virus that is proving to be a long road, this pandemic. And this is the road that we must travel. It will have bumps and will have challenges and we are facing them today. As we know, we have seen a significant rise in new cases, hospitalizations and tragically deaths. Four weeks ago, we had about 175 cases a day and I was anxious then. Yesterday, we had over 700 people in our province affected and we know that our hospitals are getting stretched our ICU capacity is getting stretched. Our communities are suffering. We also know that as more people are infected, the risk of somebody younger and others becoming, um, having severe illness or dying are greater. 
And tragically, this past week, we had a, a young person in his 30s who died from COVID-19. This is a reminder to all of us that this virus can have tragic effects on the people we are closest to and the people we love. We also have over 50 active outbreaks in our health care system. We have seen that transmission has happened sometimes in social events in our communities and it's spilled over into our long-term care homes and our hospitals. This increase has been most acute, as we know, in the Vancouver Coastal and Fraser Health regions of the province, and that is why I put in regional orders about 10 days ago. However, as we've been watching so carefully over the last few weeks, it has become apparent that this surge in transmission is happening across the province. We are now seeing increased activity in terms of community transmission, outbreaks and effects on our health care system in every health authority in the province. So now we need to do more. We need to keep our essential service, our essential activities open and operating safely. We need to keep our schools open and operating safely and our workplaces that can be open safely open. And we need to relieve the stress on our health care system right now. Right now, we are holding our own, but we know that if people cannot access health care, that it is not only people with COVID-19, but people with other urgent health issues that will suffer. And we need to do this across the province. As a result, I am extending the regional orders that currently apply to the Fraser and Vancouver Health Region across the entire province. And I am putting new province-wide orders in place. These expanded orders will come into effect today and run until uh, for starting with a two week period. That's the, the period of the incubation period. And we will be extending the orders um, from November 23rd so that the orders across the province will be in place until December 7th at midnight. We want to ensure we get through one to two incubation periods and we will be reviewing our progress regularly as we move through this next two weeks. We want to see a clear and notable difference and slowing of transmission in our province, across the province, so that we can get back into that balance, that control that we had with public health. So what does this mean? This means that the orders with regards to our social gatherings apply to the entire province. Right now, we at home need to only socialize with our immediate households. We need to delay inviting over friends and family for this period of time and reduce our social interactions as much as possible outside of our homes. As a result, I'm ordering that there'll be no social gatherings of any size with anyone other than your immediate household. This applies in our homes, vacation rentals and in the community and in public venues, including those with less than 50 people in controlled settings. Your immediate household can, of course, include roommates. And if you live on your own, you can visit with up to one or two people if you regularly spend time with them. We need to go back to what we were doing in April and May and March when we had our pandemic bubble. And so if you are somebody who lives alone, that's that one or two people that you have a close relationship with. All indoor and outdoor events as defined in my gathering and events order are not allowed to take place until further notice. So that uh, goes back and that's a bit of a technical language. Our, um, the mass gathering and events order is on the website and it refers to the, the restrictions and limits. The maximum number of people we could have in an event was 50 and these events could take place in many different places. Those are now suspended across the province for the, for, for the next two weeks. While places of worship are to have in, no in-person group uh, services for this period of time, um, we and I've had the privilege of meeting with a number of our uh, a large number of faith leaders from around the province and this 
is important and they understand that we need our faith services more than ever right now but we need to do them in a way that's safe and with the community transmission that we're seeing and the fact that we have seen transmission in some of our our faith-based settings we need to suspend those and support each other and find those ways to care for each other remotely the exceptions will be those important events, funerals and weddings and ceremonies such as baptisms, which may proceed in a limited way with a maximum of 10 people, including the officiant. There are be, to be no associated receptions inside or outside your home or at any public or community-based venue associated with these important celebrations. The exceptions do include other activities that happen with COVID safety plans in some uh, in these gathering sites, including um, medical uh, uh, group sessions, uh, sessions like uh, NA and AA meetings, with a maximum of 50 people, less if the space is smaller, and ensuring that you have COVID-19 safety plans that are in place and are being acted upon. It also does not apply to those very important work functions that we have. What we are talking about is reducing our social activities, both in our home and outside our home and around our work periods. So if uh, I work in the social services and I need to check on families, this does not apply to that situation. As well, if we um, have people who are doing work in our house, um, people who are our grandparents are coming to pick up children, those are not social gatherings. Those are essential functions that happen in and out of our home. And so those are not affected by this order. I have for many, many weeks made clear the importance of wearing masks, particularly now, as one of the measures that we have that can prevent transmission, along with those important things that we know work, like physical distancing, cleaning our hands, and staying away from others when we're not feeling well. But based on continued requests, particularly from the retail and other public sectors, to have more explicit direction for the use of masks in indoor, public and retail spaces. I've asked the Minister of Public Safety and the Solicitor General to issue a requirement for the wearing of masks for all indoor public and retail spaces for staff and customers, except where eating or drinking. This means if you are at work at your desk, you do not need to wear a mask. But if you are in a shared workspace, a common space or a public space like elevators, hallways and other common areas, you do. If you are behind service counters and you have plexiglass between you and everyone else, you do not need to wear a mask unless there are others back there with you. If you are serving customers, you do need to wear a mask. If you are in a restaurant, you need to wear a mask when you are not at your table. That includes coming into the restaurant, leaving the restaurant, going to the washroom. And staff must wear masks when they're interacting um, with others and with, uh, with other staff and with the tables. Again, this does not apply to anyone who is unable to put on or remove the mask on their own. We know that there are people with certain conditions and disabilities in some ways that would make mask wearing challenging. It does not apply to children under the age of two. And um, we need to be aware that some people's disabilities or inability to wear a mask may not be readily apparent to people. This will mean, um, t technically, <laughs> this will mean mandatory wearing of masks in all indoor public and retail spaces, not only as a, a, a workplace health and safety issue, as one of the mandates that we have had, but also to ensure that uh, owners and operators of these spaces have um, the, uh, the support behind them to ensure that customers are aware of this mandate as well. The use of the Emergency Act to do this will enable us to cover that overlap of workplace and public safety around this issue. As I announced last week, we need to understand and better manage and control indoor group physical activities where we have seen transmission happen. We've seen notable levels of transmission and there are some particular activities that are higher risk. 
I have tasked a group to look at um, this issue over the past 10 days. And as of today, I am ordering that all businesses, recreation centres or other organisations that organise or operate indoor group physical activities that include spin classes, hot yoga and high intensity interval training must stop until further notice. All other group fitness activities indoors can continue to operate, but they must um, adhere to the updated guidance that we are developing. So what this is a change from what we um, put in place last week for the Lower Mainland. It gave us an opportunity to, once we recognized that there was transmissioning happening, transmission happening in some of these settings, we took the opportunity to stop those, to put a pause so we could understand the conditions that made these more risky in some situations and others. So what we have determined that it is a combination and this is nothing, this is what we're learning over time. It's those closed environments where we have people close together, where we're exerting for, and when we have poorer ventilation and when there's often loud music. Those are the settings that are most at risk and we are seeing around the world that those are, are, are challenging um, settings and they invite this virus to spread. And we know that at this time of year, when we know the virus is spreading faster in, this, uh, in the climate that we have right now and the higher rates in our community, that these high-risk activities cannot happen for the, foreseeable, excuse me, for the foreseeable future. So that is uh, the focus that we are looking at right now. We had included other indoor group fitness activities like dance, like some of the um, uh, uh, other uh, low intensity, lower intensity fitness classes um, and we will be updating the guidance on uh, how those can operate safely including uh, additional space, reduced numbers, um, making sure that people have uh, book ahead for example and have the same class with the same people at the same time. So there's a number of new guidelines that are being finalized and will be posted. Last week I made the requirement that uh, people had to adhere to the updated guidance and had to have their, gu their new plans um, approved by the local MHO before they could restart these activities. That is no longer the case. We have uh, narrowed down those activities that we feel are too high risk to happen right now and those will be suspended. All other indoor group activities must as we've um, had in the past, must update their COVID safety plans to adhere to the new guidelines and have those publicly posted. And they are, however, placed on our watch list and we will be watching carefully because we know even some of these lower risk uh, activities, if they're not, uh, these plans are not followed um, intensely that we can have transmission and we will be monitoring this and we will be shutting down gyms or studios where these uh, safety plans are not being followed. There were, I understand, a small number of these facilities that may have included some of these high-risk activities that had received uh, a notice from Vancouver Coastal Health that notice will be rescinded. If you have any of these uh, high risk activities, so spin classes, hot yoga, high intensity interval training, those are not approved right now. For all sports, um, the other issue that we talked about in t 10 days ago was about reducing contact sports indoors and uh, we have looked again at the measures and the risks that are associated with uh, ongoing sporting activities. We also recognize how important it is, particularly for youth but for adults as well, um, to have the opportunities to engage in these sporting activities in a safe way during this pandemic. So what we have uh, done now is that we will continue with the uh, Via Sport Phase 3 activities with the exceptions. There are to be no spectators at indoor or outdoor sports and there will be no travel for any of these sports outside of your local community. So that is the restrictions that we need to have in place now across the province to ensure that we can have these important sport activities um, continue 
but in a safe way during this pandemic. I have seen the incredible effort that so many businesses and organizations have put into retooling, adjusting their businesses to make, op make sure they can stay open and do it safely. The vast majority of businesses around the province are doing a great job. We only have to look at things like hair salons and spas and retail stores to show that when rules are followed and when safety measures are in place, we're not seeing transmission of this virus. And we see that as well in restaurants where we are following the, the conditions that we've put in place um, that we don't see transmission. Right now, we are asking um, all office-based employers to temporarily suspend those important efforts to safely get workers back into their workplaces and to support working at home where possible until at least the new year. For anyone going to work, it is important that we minimize all of those social interactions with our colleagues before, during and after work. Those are the things where we are, are seeing transmission in communities, in workplaces around the province. And it is many different types of workplaces. So many of them are essential workplaces. We know we have seen it recently in food production plants, in uh, uh, retail outlets, uh, where um, staff are gathering together. We've seen it in every setting from uh, banks to car dealerships, to other settings where it is staff who are getting together and we don't remember that we are we have to take precautions with each other that we have our own social networks our social connections and we can inadvertently bring that virus in and spread it within our work setting as well i also want to make uh, so i i recognize we talked about this for the lower mainland but across the province active inspections will be increased in all business settings to ensure that we have those important COVID safety plans and that workers and the public are protected in all settings around the province. I want to make a particular note about bars in particular and pubs and as you know there's some cha challenges with our the way the liquor licenses are run. Those are settings where we have uh, have concerns that safety plans may not be followed and people may be mixing in a way that can be risky. We will be uh, paying particular effort to inspecting COVID safety plans, to making sure that they are being adhered to in these settings. And if we have challenges, if we find that they are not being adhered to, these businesses will be closed down. And specifically in the Vancouver Coastal and Fraser Health Region, where we have seen a lot of transmission in the recent weeks related to spillover into workplaces, we have established, uh, I've asked one of my deputy provincial health officers to work with uh, the environmental health officers from both Fraser Health and Coastal, Vancouver Coastal Health to establish a rapid response team to focus on those workplace issues, to liaise with the, the inspectors from WorkSafe BC but also to, uh, uh, to find and target the clusters and outbreaks that we're seeing and manage them rapidly. And part of that, again, will be um, shutting down businesses where the safety plans are not adequate. So this is the time for everybody to pay attention, to make sure that you revisit and step up your safety efforts to ensure these protocols are fully implemented. I know many people did an excellent job very early on, but we have seen slippage. This means that all businesses and work sites across the province must conduct active daily health screening. It can be done through an app, online, or when people arrive at the site. And businesses need to ensure that all workers and customers maintain that appropriate physical distancing, maintain all of the safety measures that are in place, and wear masks when needed. I also want to talk about travel. We talked about this uh, in 10 days ago, and I am not putting a travel order in place. However, as the Premier mentioned yesterday, it is our expectation that everybody in BC right now will limit their travel as much as possible, unless it is essential. So it is limiting our recreational and travel for social reasons that we're talking about. This includes travel within the province and travel to other parts of Canada. I'm asking people again, we need to step back. 
We need to stay local. Stay within your community as much as possible. Of course, if you need to travel for work, for a medical appointment, for reasons that are, are essential, that does not apply. I absolutely recognize that tourism is important to our, our communities, to our economy, and the significant efforts that many of our tourist businesses have put in place uh, for safety plans for themselves and uh, for their guests and staff. The challenge that we are facing is that we have seen a significant increase in transmission across many jurisdictions across this country. And uh, we only need to wish we had the same um, small um, numbers of people coming here as the Atlantic bubble, but that's not to be for us. The challenge we are facing, though, is people are coming to BC from these other jurisdictions as well. And we know for international travel, there is uh, appropriate mechanisms in place for quarantine. That is not in place for travel interprovincially. So we are asking when there are people who are coming to BC in, in the next uh, two to four weeks, if they can postpone their trip here, they should. If not, then we need to be sure that they will minimize. They need to be aware that the expectation is that they will follow the orders that we have in place here, and these orders are enforceable. So that will be minimizing your social interactions with others, making sure you follow all of the orders and guidelines we have in place here. For students who may re be returning home, keep to your household only when you come back. And that uh, it, it applies to, to people who are returning um, to be with their families right now. As previously noted, any travel within the region even is suspended for sports for everyone right now. What does this mean? It means, yes, you can move about within your region. If you live in Penticton, you can go to Summerland. If you live in Victoria, though, and you want to go to Tofino, not such a good idea right now. If you need to go to a store in another community, then plan ahead and go as infrequently as possible for this next short period of time. If you are thinking about skiing, go to a local mountain. And if you are in doubt, postpone it. Postpone it to a time when we have better management of the, the transmission that we're seeing in our communities right now. The focus about this is making sure that we can keep our communities functioning. We can keep our businesses that are working safely open. We can keep the pressure off our hospitals, our ICUs, our long-term care homes. We can protect those people who are elders and our seniors and people in need of health care. As well, it's important for us to keep schools open. We know that schools are an important, safe place for children around this province. Many of the additional efforts announced today are to focus on those priorities, including our schools. As I noted last week, transmission in schools has been low, but we have had many, many more exposure events from the adults and the students in our school settings. I'm also hearing that this is concerning. This is concerning to our parents, to teachers, to all of us in the school community. And we need to make sure that we can keep up with and make sure everybody is informed as best as possible. And we know that this is most acute in the areas where most of our schools are and right now where most of the transmission is happening. And that is in the lower mainland in the Fraser and Vancouver coastal health areas. I have directed uh, this week that one of my deputy provincial health officers will lead a, a coordinated effort to try and manage and improve that situation with a focus of working with our teams in Vancouver Coastal and Fraser Health to have a coordinated ad approach to identifying and managing uh, school exposures and outbreaks um, quickly and to improve our ability to communicate and to manage these events together with our school communities. As part of this, I also remind parents and caregivers to be aware of things like mingling and the drop-offs before and after school and reminding the adults in our school set, uh, setting that the out-of-classroom um, interactions are important to manage safely as well. 
Getting through this surge in new places and through our pandemic requires all of us to do our part and to support each other to do this. We need to urgently reduce the level of transmission and our cases across the province in these next two weeks. We need to ensure our health care system can meet the health needs of all of us here in BC. I especially, though, want to recognize and appeal to young people and young adults to help us in this effort. I know how difficult this has been for you and the impact on your lives. I know that you have been missing birthdays and graduations and celebrations of these important transitional moments in our lives. I also know that you have been role models and inspirations. Young people have proven that they have resilience, that you're adaptable, and that you're brave. And I'm calling on all of you right now. I need you. I need you to be superheroes, to step up, to hold the line, and to help all of us get through this. As we approach the darkest days of this year, there is light at the end of that tunnel. We know that there's vaccines on the horizon, and I am hopeful that early in the new year, we'll start to have some of those tools to help us protect those who are most at risk. But right now, we all need to focus our efforts on slowing the spread and bending our curve back down. That is what will get us through these next few months. We need to support our friends our neighbours and take care of those who are most at risk. We need to protect our hospitals, our long-term care homes, our seniors, our elders and our communities. And we will get through this and we will do it as we have been doing it by being kind to each other, by being calm even when it's uncertain and anxious. And that is what will keep us safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. And uh, I wanted to start by uh, expressing my condolences, those of the premiers, those of the province, to the uh, family of the person who passed away uh, in the last day from COVID-19 in BC in Fraser Health. Uh, we know what a difficult time this is to grieve. And every case, every person matters uh, to their family, to their friends, their community, and to us. And uh, this has been, I think it's fair to say, a particularly difficult week uh, in terms, and particularly in long-term care with people passing away. And we I want to express to all of the families, all of those who've lost loved ones in this pandemic, our, uh, our profound uh, thoughts uh, at their loss, which is, I think, significant and very challenging right now to grieve. Uh, I wanted to... Uh, express uh, my ongoing appreciation uh, to the ongoing to the extraordinary teams in public health. Uh, you, you'll see and you've heard from Dr. Henry 6,929 active cases of COVID-19 in BC, 9,977 people uh, in isolation under public health surveillance, and of course, significant numbers of people in our hospitals, 217 people in hospital today, 204 of them in the Fraser Health and Vancouver Coastal Health authorities. And it's that context, the fact that over the last four weeks, our rolling average, our seven-day average of case counts has increased four times. The fact that the number of people in hospital has increased over those four-week uh, period uh, to some number between 60 and 70 had been bouncing around to today's number of 217. The fact that the number of people in ICU has gone up and the fact that we have a significant more greatly greater number of outbreaks in our long-term care homes, these are all reasons for action. So when we summarize those actions, when we say in terms of gatherings only right now with the people in your immediate households, when, we, when Dr. Henry orders that outside social gatherings not the 50-person maximum, but outside social gatherings not occur in this two-week period. 
as we discussed with faith leaders yesterday, more than 140 of them from around uh, British Columbia with the Premier and Dr. Henry, that, that um, places of worship will move to virtual services for this period with the exception of baptisms and weddings and funerals where a maximum of 10 people can be but where there's no uh, associated receptions. When we ask people to travel for essential purposes only, when we ask all businesses in BC to revisit their safety plans to ensure active daily screening of workers and the other conditions that are so central to the control of COVID-19, when we talk, that when we say, when, when it's ordered by provincial, under the Emerg Provincial Emergencies Act, that it's mandatory to wear masks in all indoor public and retail spaces for staff and customers in all workplaces for elevators, corridors between shared areas, group or break, break rooms and shared kitchens, uh, except of course when people uh, need to eat. It's because of that, because of that that we need people to suspend and ensure that as many people as possible in office settings can work at home and continue to work at home and we're increasing our site inspections and that we're canceling. We're saying that there are no more indoor group fitness classes and that we're saying that there's specific rules that people involved in team sports, that there be no spectators at indoor sports events and that there be no travel outside of your local community for sports related activities. And that the effort of the public health care system expands outward. All of those things are what we can do together to help stop the spread and help our citizens, uh, our fellow citizens, our families, our friends, our communities, our workplaces, the children in our society who need to go to school, all of those who need surgery and need our support in long term care. These are the means through which, in every part of British Columbia, in every part of British Columbia, because the number of cases, of course, in the three other health authorities have increased, these are the means through which all of us can help flatten the curve, but also do what we want to do in this pandemic, which is our part. I wanted to note um, uh, two things that we've added, um, two reports that I usually give on Thursday. I'm going to do them very briefly because this has been, as you can say, a, uh, as you know, a very busy day. We've added, um, uh, pursuant to the Premier's announcement at the end of August, uh, 702 contact tracers have been hired in BC. That's an increase of 66 from last week, 434 more are in the interview stage and 102 more in the offer stage. And we're also funding uh, cul culturally uh, sensitive contact tracing uh, supports for 76 positions with the First Nations Health Authority. That's more than 1,000 people in the end because we're going to add the number of people we intend to hire to do contact tracing. It's going to now be 950 plus the 76 in the FNHA, more than 1,000 people in addition to those who were doing contact tracing prior to, um, prior to uh, the Premier's announcement in August. And uh, finally, I just want to say with respect to surgeries that from the week of November 2nd to 8th, we uh, set a record for this year in the number of surgeries completed in BC, both, uh, both uh, scheduled and non-scheduled surgery. That number was 7,280. This past week, the 9th to the 15th, the number is less because of Remembrance Day. It's 5,520, more than the equivalent uh, period last year. And this reflects, I think, an extraordinary achievement by our entire healthcare system. So essentially uh, and simply, uh, the question remains, do we fight? Do we fight together in this time, in this important time, when uh, we see perhaps on the horizon some opportunity with respect to vaccine? Do we fight right now to reduce the spread of COVID-19 in BC and help, our, help one another, help each other, help ourselves get through this pandemic? And I think the answer is yes, we all have the tools in our hands, the guidance provided by our medical health officers, the guidance provided by Dr. Henry to do so. And uh, these orders today give us all the means to be 100% all in. I can tell you that our healthcare system is, our healthcare workers are, across, uh, across BC society, the people who work in our grocery stores are, the people who work in transportation are, I know the people in education are. We need to all be 100% all in in the battle against COVID-19. These orders give us direction today and we must give them the power they require to be effective. We need to make these orders work to stop the spread and being 100% all in will get each of us and all of us there. Aujourd'hui, nous annonçons 538 nouveaux cas qui ont testé positifs pour COVID-19 pour un total de 24 960 cas en Colombie-Britannique. Nous sommes attristés d'annoncer un nouveau décès 
lié au Covid-19 pour un total de 321 décès en Colombie-Britannique. Nous offrons nos condoléances à tous ceux qui ont perdu leurs proches durant cette pandémie. Um, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. We're happy to take your questions. Thank you, Minister. As a reminder to everybody on the phone, please press star one to enter the queue. You are limited to one question and one follow-up. I would also ask that you please take your phones off mute. You will not be audible until I call your name. First question today is from Rob Shaw, Vancouver Sun. Oh, hi. Um, I just would like to ask why the travel restrictions uh, are not uh, a provincial order and what would have been different if you had gone that route in terms of checking to make sure people aren't traveling inappropriately or having some mechanism to sort of stop and, and make sure that they are following the rules? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, it's exactly that. Um, I don't believe that we need to do that. We have a lot of uh, essential travel that comes back and forth. Um, we get a lot of our essential goods um, that come um, here on the island by ferry, um, back and forth um, through the United States and other parts of Canada. So it, the to step up that infrastructure and to have some mechanism to do that um, is very challenging. But we also know that when we had these same um, requirements in place earlier this year, that people took them to heart. We're talking about recreational and social travel, and it's very challenging sometimes to be able to understand. And I know I started to get uh, concerns from people again that they're seeing Alberta license plates and, and U.S. license plates, and it really is about um, remembering that we don't always know people's stories, and there are many reasons why somebody may be coming. They may have been here for a number of months now, we know that. Um, they may have a need to check on a family member. So there's many different uh, ways that we understand essential travel, and we trust people to take the right actions now, because we are all being affected by this. Do you have a follow-up, Rob? Uh, sure, thanks. Could I get a sense from you what kind of metrics you'll be using to determine if these restrictions are successful over the next two weeks? Is it daily case counts or how much of a, a percentage decrease do you want to see in certain areas to be able to know that um, this is the circuit breaker method that you've been talking about? Yeah, uh, so we, we watch a lot of things. Um, certainly uh, daily counts, case counts are part of it and our rolling average because the day-to-day -day variation uh, can reflect a number of things. Um, so we are watching that very carefully. We're watching our ability to find people quickly, and that has been challenged, um, particularly in the, the Lower Mainland Health Authorities, where uh, we have had so many cases per day. It's been a challenge for us to, to find people, to find their contacts in a safe and uh, quick way, in a timely way. So we're watching that. We're watching a very important metric that helps us understand if, if we're holding on in public health which is the percentage of people where we cannot link them to a known case or a cluster. And um, being able to, to follow up and uh, stop clusters before they grow into larger outbreaks. And so we're at the brink with that, and that is the area that I'm most concerned about. And we initially, uh, that was in the Lower Mainland Health Authorities, and that's why we put the restrictions on there to start. But as you have seen, um, you know, there are things that we are learning about this virus, that it can spread more easily, that uh, people's um, trajectories of how they move from place to place are not always uh, linear. And that means we can get wide transmission before we recognize it. So we need to put these in place across the province now, and we'll be watching that. We'll be watching the spillover piece into uh, where people are, um, are, are getting infected and where they're going. So we now are seeing, um, as you know, a lot long-term care outbreaks and acute care facilities outbreaks. So yes, those are important. Um, we have seen a decrease in the, uh, the number of people who have been infected from attending social gatherings. So it is making a difference in the Lower Mainland. We've started to see that decrease. Now we need to focus on some of the uh, workplace settings where we're seeing increases and uh, long-term care where we're seeing increases. So. It is a balance. There's a whole bunch of things that we look at and agonize about every day, but those are those are the basic ones. Next question is from Ian Bailey, Global Mail. 
Uh, Dr. Henry, um, I just want to go back to the issue of Fraser Health, which I know was something dealt with in the um, the background briefing on this. Uh, public health officials, especially in light of the new uh, high counts there today, public health officials are sort of flagged such issues as dense housing and essential workers as key to the high counts in the Fraser Health region. But these are presumably relevant to other parts of B.C. So, like, are there more essential workers in Fraser Health, more dense housing, what's making these high counts so distinct? What, what explains these high counts? Yeah, so there's a variety of things. We know that the, the highest population base is in um, the, the lower mainland, particularly uh, you know, how we've broken it up by health region. The largest health region by population is Fraser Health. It's a long, younger population with uh, larger numbers of families and children. The vast majority of our schools, the, by a large uh, uh, amount, the, the highest numbers of schools are in the Fraser Health region. We have lots of families that work in uh, that live in multi-generational homes. There's uh, cultural reasons why people come together, why it's so important to um, to have um, community together in a large numbers. And, you know, I, I know many of my uh, colleagues and friends who are from uh, the South Asian community, for example, you know, having two or three hundred people as your immediate family is is normal and is important and is part of how um, life is lived. And and these are things, unfortunately, that this virus can exploit. It doesn't recognize who we are, but it recognizes that when we're in crowded situations indoors, that we can pass it on. And from the very beginning. You know, we have said that this virus is transmitted most often to the people we are closest to. So we are seeing some of that effect. We also know that uh, many of those high risk, uh, um, uh, um, what am I trying to say, high risk businesses like uh, essential businesses like our food processing plants, like um, fruit warehousing, uh, all of those places are in the, the uh, Fraser Valley, um, poultry plants. We know that much of the trucking industry, people live there. And many of our essential workers, healthcare workers um, in Vancouver Coastal um, live in the, in the Fraser Health region. So there's a whole variety of reasons why we are seeing increased numbers there. We knew that was uh, uh, likely to happen, um, but we, we had that rapid increase in the middle of October that was a, a whole bunch of different issues coming together at once. It was social gatherings, it was the fact that this virus was being transmitted, that we were having things indoors. So uh, I think right now we are, we are seeing that reflected in a smaller scale around the province and we all need to pay attention to the things that we can do to stop our social interactions, to put the brakes on this virus now. Okay. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah, and just, uh, I suppose one thing further to remember that, and I, I very strongly believe this, I know Dr. Henry does as well, that we're all in this together. And uh, there was a time early in the pandemic when uh, more of the cases, even though Vancouver Coastal Health was smaller, were in Vancouver Coastal Health. The, in the reverse of what we say about Fraser Health, which is its BC's youngest population, also has an impact on other health authorities. Vancouver Coastal Health has essentially the same number of people who have passed away as Fraser Health, even though it has significantly fewer people. In uh, the middle of the summer in Fraser Health, a disproportionate number of our cases within Fraser Health were in the Abbotsford area now. It's in Surrey. But we have cases throughout the province. And just to put it in context, I think the the number of cases today outside of uh, uh, the Metro Vancouver Health Authorities is 51. Well, four weeks ago, that averaged about four or five. This pandemic is everywhere. We need to support each other everywhere. And that is right now particularly true in Fraser Health. But these circumstances can change in communities, and it shows why the steps we have to take in Fraser Health today need to be taken everywhere and why it's so important, I think, and why Dr. Henry made the decision today to extend the orders that were for Vancouver Coastal Health and for Fraser Health uh, to the whole province. I live uh, in Vancouver Coastal Health, uh, four blocks from Fraser Health. Uh, that's an administrative distinction, but what it, uh, what it tells us, I think, uh, what all of this information tells us is what a difficult uh, pandemic this is, how difficult it is to manage this, and how we're all in this together, every single one of us. Do you have a follow-up, Ian? Yes. Um, 
Um, are there any, uh, you know, given these numbers that are still consistently high, are there any specific or distinct strategies being considered to get things under control or the numbers down in Fraser Health? If yes, what? And if not, why not? Yeah, so uh, I've sort of announced all of those strategies that we're talking about. Um, in particular, we focusing on uh, having our uh, supporting our contact tracers in the the lower mainland, so both Vancouver and Fraser Health, to to get on top of being able to find people in a timely way to make sure that we're catching uh, that we're we're understanding where the clusters are happening, getting on them quickly, and focusing on where we are seeing transmission happening. So. So having our, uh, for lack of a better name, a rapid response team that one of my deputies will be supporting with the environmental health officers, focusing on where we are seeing transmission now in some uh, um, business settings, focusing on um, what we've been doing all along, but enhancing our ability to protect our health care system, whether it's long-term care or acute care where we're seeing outbreaks happening. So there is absolutely an intense focus on that. But the measures that you're seeing today are the ones that we expect will work if we all do our part. Just one statistical thing uh, as well, Ian, we've transferred significant contract tracing, uh, contact tracing uh, capacity to Fraser Health, uh, including 43 staff people from the Provincial Health Services Authority who do contact tracing to Fraser Health. Obviously the uh, largest share of the people we've hired are working in Fraser Health. Uh, Dr. Henry and I had a chance when we were in Surrey recently to see them do their, uh, to do their work, uh, and uh, uh, they're doing an extraordinary job. And I think uh, we'll continue, obviously, as we have in the past, to focus resources where resources are needed. And so, in terms of the uh, the significant uh, amount of resources being transferred, obviously, us, in terms of the resources, of the healthcare system, from contact tracing to primary care to support for hospitals, support for long-term care. Obviously, right now, Fraser Health is uh, at the center of all that, although we have significant issues in all of the other health authorities. Next question is from Richard Zussman, Global News. Dr. Henry, I just want to ask about masks. So why the switch now after there's been a lot of questions to you towards that? Will people be given a badge or some sort of identifier to show that they can't wear a mask or don't have to for those physically unable to? And why no masks in schools? <laughs> okay. So uh, the, the answer to the first question is, um, as I have said many, many times, there is uh, a mandate in our occupational health and safety, and that is what is uh, reflected in um, the orders uh, that are coming from the, the um, Minister of Public Safety. So I stand by what we have always had in place, and I think uh, we won't get into semantics, but what we have said is it is my expectation that we wear masks as an important piece and no more important than now um, in terms of uh, one of the measures that we have to pre prevent infections. Um, it, it, sorry, I, I got distracted by you had three questions. One of them was, oh, no, we, we take people at their word. There is no way that we will force people to have medical notes or, or other things. We need to trust that people um, who cannot wear masks and there are some people who cannot wear masks. We need to be able to accommodate them, and that will mean in some cases that they can uh, have remote pickup or that they go to, um, to receive services at times when there are other people not around. So there, and, and I think we have to focus on, you know, the, this people in retail settings um, going into uh, get a driver's license renewed it's the, those are not the situations where we're seeing transmission of infection but it is important that workers feel that they are protected and that they have the appropriate measures in place to require both workplaces and uh, people who are entering those public spaces and retail spaces uh, to protect them and protect each other schools are not public open spaces. You cannot go walk into a school. We have uh, layers of measures of protection in place in schools. And like I wouldn't wear a mask sitting at my office, 
Um, we don't expect children to wear masks sitting at their desks all day long. We do have expectations in schools around um, those common areas where, where uh, children and adults in the school setting are mingling and uh, those are part of the safety plans that are in place in all of the schools. Do you have a follow-up, Richard? I do, and I apologize for the multi-part questions. Uh, this is going to be another one. Uh, a lot of questions around what it means to have activities within your own community. So can you explain to people when these sports games can take place, where can people go to play? Is it your city? Is it your neighborhood, your health authority? The same with something like skiing. How far can someone ski to one of the North Shore ski hills? And another point of clarity that uh, faith organizations have brought up is what if they're holding things like, in some cases, Guadalajara's are holding um, community, uh, they prepare meals for a number of people in the community. Are they still allowed to gather in order to hold those events to provide uh, meals or other things for community? Yeah, so addressing the second one first, and we did talk about things like that. And uh, no, it's not an event to prepare meals. And they need to have COVID safety plans in place, which um, they have in many of the uh, the settings where the meals are provided. And they need to be individually packaged. What we aren't having is people coming in and sitting together and having those meals. They have a process, and I, I have a tremendous admiration for the, uh, the Gurdwaras in particular who do this, where they provide those meals to families in need. So those absolutely can continue. I know many of our uh, faith buildings are used for 12-step um, meetings, for example, or for daycare or for uh, additional studies for, for children. And those can continue with the appropriate safety measures in place. Those are not events in the, in the context of this order. Um, in terms of how far can you go, well, you know, this is not an order. This is telling people to use their common sense. And when we're talking about the sports teams, um, part of the what the sports networks and the sports organizations had interregional travel, so they have their own defined regions, and that needs to stop. You can play the games within your own region only, um, and there's no travel between different areas. Um, that is where we're seeing the risk and the risk is people carpooling together having to stay overnight because some of the regions were you know from South Island to North Island or um, you know Powell River to the mainland that has to stop right now we can't have that type of travel and we also need to pay attention to those pre-game post-game um, off the field of play situations where we're coming together and that's where the no spectators comes in because we have seen that um, people are getting together it's hard um, you know you go into the locker room so having provisions in place and I know some teams have done this really well where people come pre-dressed and so we're not in the locker room we have to resist that temptation to go out with the guys after the hockey game so those are the things that we need to put aside right now so that we can continue to focus on the opportunities, particularly for kids to, to get out there with their teammates, to do drills, to have games in their local community. Next question is from Pooja Sakhan, Red FM. Um, hi, Dr. Henry. Thank you so much for taking my question. Uh, a portion of it you have already answered, but could you explain or rather elaborate on the new orders around religious places. Uh, can people visit temples and gurdwaras with their families or are you banning visits to religious places completely? No, I'm not banning visits to religious places at all. Um, there needs to be processes in place so that people can go, they can keep their distance, they wear masks when they're in common areas, all of the things that you have been doing so far. What we're saying is those services that were um, explicitly under the event order where people came together at specific times and it was up to 50 people in the space depending on how large the space was, that we need those to be suspended it for this short period of time because we have seen that despite our best efforts we have transmission happening in those events. Do you have a follow-up Pooja? Yeah in, in terms of essential traveling if someone has booked a vacation to uh, maybe go to Whistler next week are you asking them to cancel it? I'm asking them to consider whether they need to go um, whether this is the time that they uh, can go 
um, and if they can postpone it. Next question is from Binder Sajjan, CTV. Binder, are you there? Yes, I Go ahead. am here. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, sorry, yeah, Dr. Henry, I'm just wondering, when it comes to uh, the mask mandate, when does that come into effect? How is that going to be enforced? Will there be fun? What can an employee do if somebody comes in and refuses to wear a mask? It yeah, so those details are being worked out by the Ministry of Public Safety and the Solicitor General under the Emergency Programs Act. It does give owners and operators of retail spaces, public spaces, the ability to um, call on uh, police. It also means that there can be fines and there's ways that they can deal with um, employee safety uh, under the, the Public Safety Act. So the details will become clear over the next week. Binder, do you have a follow-up? Yes, and just on schools, um, you know, parents are wondering if the winter break will be extended. Some might see these numbers and think maybe they need to pull their kids out of school. So just wondering when that decision will be made and where would case numbers need to be essentially to, to keep schools open? Yeah, so as we have seen all along, schools are a safe place. Um, we are not seeing lots of transmission. We've seen lots of exposure events, and that reflects what's happening in our community. So we are not at the point where we would consider closing schools, and we know that we have to do our best in the community so we can protect the essential work that's going on in schools, how important it is for, for children. And, and I just have to say that I, I so... Uh, admire our teachers and educators and the work that they've been doing to make sure that children have that learning experience that is so critical for them at this point in their lives and we need to celebrate and support the work they're doing and part of these orders is to make sure that we can continue to do that. Um, in terms of uh, over the holidays, those discussions are ongoing. It is not only about the schools, it's about our, uh, our community, um, it's not, uh, it's about a number of different issues and there are many people that need to be involved in those discussions um, and when we have come up with our uh, discussion, decision about that, uh, we'll let you know. Colton Davies, Radio NL. Hi, Dr. Henry. Uh, for out-of-province residents uh, working in BC on major projects like the Trans Mountain Pipeline, for example, uh, who might go home to Alberta or from Kamloops to the Lower Mainland, for example, to see families on their days off, I'm assuming would that be deemed essential travel, yes or no? And how much of a concern has this been for you and, and uh, health officials um, about the potential spread from those situations, uh, especially when you uh, uh, consider the cases reported at LNG Canada today? Yeah, so um, yes, it is essential travel. Work travel is essential travel. Um, this has been, uh, industrial camps have been a huge concern of ours from the very beginning. You will recall that we actually have an order around uh, COVID safety plan in, in industrial plants um, and other uh, settings uh, like the silviculture in the summer where we had um, thousands of people coming to plant trees over the summer period. And those safety plans have been really good. They have worked. We've had very few cases. Those cases have been isolated. Um, for people, it's been a challenge, I know, for people working in those environments because they cannot have those social interactions that they would normally have had in that um, in those work environments and they have uh, barriers in place when people come in there's testing in place as needed um, there's isolation and, and monitoring of contacts and this is we've had uh, less than uh, half a dozen um, individual cases of people being ex uh, coming into uh, having exposure events so people coming in and testing positive for COVID. So this is our first outbreak. Um, it was caught and, and it's being managed. Um, we know there's about 30 or 40 people who are in isolation and being monitored. We don't believe that there's been exposures in the community and I know Northern Health is working really carefully with them um, on managing this outbreak. It is a reflection of the risk that we run um, across the province, where across the country when uh, 
when rates are high um, all over the place. So, so far the safety plans have been um, really <laughs> have been something that we have been focused on and are important and have been working and, you know, celebrating the things that we planted three million trees this uh, this summer trees that would have been lost if we had not had those plans in place and being able um, to get people up into some of the more remote remote areas to to do the planting. Colton, do you have a follow up? Yes, and thanks for that answer. Uh, just a quick question for clarity, because uh, with uh, obviously this is an extension for the restrictions already in place for the Lower Mainland, but it's new for. Uh, places like Interior Health. Uh, just curious, is this immediate from when you uh, spoke about this about an hour ago, or would it be 10 p.m. tonight? It, it, we're, we're saying midnight tonight, uh, and um, then we'll catch it up, and it, all of these will apply until at least December 7th, um, and we will be monitoring and we'll be talking, of course, over that period of time and watching how things are going and adjusting if we need to. We have time for one more question today. For everyone listening, Dr. Henry and Minister Dix will release a statement this afternoon with the latest information on cases, hospitalizations, and outbreaks, which you can find at news.gov.bc.ca. For updated information about regional orders, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash regional restrictions. And for information about the province's pandemic supports, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. Last question is from Naomi Mukanda, CBC Radio Canada. Oh, thank you. I was just about to sign up. Well, my question has been asked. I would like to uh, ask uh, Minister Dix if he can talk a little more about, maybe before uh, Dr. Henry, when you see what's going on in Quebec with schools, you just ask that, uh, is it something that uh, you're thinking about here? And then if Dr. Um, Minister Dix can say it in French, if schools going to be closed or um if uh, the Christmas holidays are going to be extended for kids here in BC, uh, so I, I I have to say that um, I know that uh, Quebec was making an announcement at five o'clock their time, um, but I have not heard what the announcement was, so I can't uh, actually respond to your question. Other than we are looking at whether we will extend the the holiday break or not, and there's pros and cons as we talked about the other day here um, uh, on doing that, um, and there's implications on a variety of different parts of our communities. So that decision has not yet been made here. Oui, je dirais que je pense que la conférence de presse au, au Québec, euh, euh, c'était euh, cet après-midi. Donc, euh, j ai, j ai, on n'a pas encore ces renseignements. Mais ce qui est important est le suivant, je pense, partout dans le monde, partout dans le monde, euh, cet automne, en comparaison de, euh, de, de, du printemps, on essaie partout dans le monde, que ce soit en France, que ce soit en Allemagne, que ce soit en Italie, que ce soit en Grande-Bretagne, que ce soit en Irlande, que ce soit dans les provinces du, au Canada. Il est essentiel, fondamental, d'assurer que nos enfants euh, peuvent euh, aller à l'école. Et ça va continuer d'être une priorité ici. On va considérer cette question des vacances Euh, au mois de décembre ou au mois de janvier. Euh, Ce n'est pas seulement une question de l'école, mais on va travailler sur cette question. On va avoir euh, des recommandations. Il y a, des, 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 euh, bien entendu, des, des raisons pour et contre euh, cette démarche. On va euh, étudier, on va regarder d'autres euh, euh, provinces et d'autres pays, et puis on va, on va trancher, mais euh, pas aujourd'hui. Before we get to Naomi's follow-up, I'd just like to remind everybody that you can find the new orders, the updated orders from today at gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. And Naomi, do you have a follow-up? No? Okay. That's all the time we have. Thank you. Thank you.